Hey guys, what's going on? I got a great guest today. He's one of the most colorful guys in radio. He, Lab, what's going on, brother? What's going on, Vanilla Ice? What's the word? <laughs> oh, you know, just hanging out, doing a podcast, bugging the crap out of uh, former Bengal players and Bengal players and trying to get as many people on here as I can. So I appreciate you coming on there. I know you're busy. No problem, sir. So let's just get into this here. What do you, uh, how do you feel about the Bengals so far going into the season with them fixing the offensive line, adding all the guys in the draft, the DBs area? What, what's your feeling going into the season? Yeah, I think as you as you mentioned, they addressed uh, you know a couple of big areas of uh, need in terms of uh, re redoing a position group with the offensive line. I mean, they've got uh, in free agency they 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 signed three veteran players that are all proven guys. Um, two interior offensive linemen they signed obviously have, have played in and won a Super Bowl. They both played with Tom Brady, so they know what it's supposed to look like. Right. Um, and then. You know, you pick up Collins at the right tackle position and, uh, you know, to, to compliment uh, Karras and Kappa inside, you got him on the outside. And he's, he, in my mind, he's a premier guy. I mean, I mm -hmm. think he's going to be a guy that's going to, you know, set a set a, a big time physical tone for the offensive line. He's a he's a downhill run blocking guy and he's an outstanding pass protector as well. It's, it's going to it's going to have a whole new look to it. There's no question about it. Jonah Williams will be. Um, you know, starting at the left tackle position, but the left guard position is up for grabs and going to be a new center, right guard and right tackle. Uh, and and then, you know, you compound it with uh, the fact that in, in last year's draft, you spent your second, fourth and sixth round guys on guys that have shown they belong, shown they can play. And now they have a year under their belt of understanding what it like, it's like to play in the National Football League, understanding how Frank Pollock wants things done and why he wants them done the way he, wa he wants them done. So I think th they've got another year of development. Uh, so, you know, you get roster depth there and they're all quite a few of them are going to be competing for that left guard position because that thing is up for grabs. And uh, and then you, you you take care of that in free agency and then you address your uh, defensive backs in the draft. And you draft a lot of speed. You run you, you draft guys, three guys that are under four, four forties, which is dynamic. You know, you get two, right. four, three eights and a, and a four, three, six. Um, not only Lou Anarumo and the Bengal defensive backfield coaches are smiling, but so is Darren Simmons on special teams because that uh, team speed trickles down, and he's he's got a lot faster coverage teams right now as a result of the the draft. And and looking at the uh, the guys that they they signed the college free agents, they got they got some prospects there. I mean, went down and watched them uh, last Tuesday, and a, a couple of guys that, that that caught my eye made some made some uh, some notes on. Um, Mississippi, they, they did a good job going into Mississippi. They picked up Tisdale defensive end, 6'5", 285, runs a 4'6", 40, Ooh. which is which is crazy. Yeah. He's, 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 got, he's got a lot of traits that uh, that definitely um, translate to the National Football League. And then uh, an offensive lineman in the center plays guard as well, Ben Brown from, from Mississippi, 6'5", 310, 315 pounders, played center and guard at, uh, at Ole Miss. He tore his bicep. Uh, right, right, and ha had a problem with that, obviously. So he's a guy that I know a lot of teams around the league had rated as high as a as a fifth round draft pick, and he decides to come to the Bengals as a as a free agent, and and uh, so that you know that was a that was a good signing. N another guy that they they signed, uh, Carson Wells, six three over two hundred and forty pounds. Um, you know he's he's a uh, <laughs> He's got some skill set too. I, at linebacker, he looked pretty good to me. He kind of reminded me of, uh, of of Jordan Evans a little bit, the, okay. the size and the, and the kind of the athletic ability that Jordan Evans is, has done for Darren Simmons on special teams and taking snaps from the line of scrimmage. And then the one that kind of really jumped out to me, uh, Tyson Anderson, watching him right lining the corner. Yeah, um, he, he's. I tell you, man, I know he played corner in high school. He played. More safety in college than he did corner, but he looked like he played corner to me in that uh, in the in the little camp they had on Tuesday. Cam Taylor Britt wasn't there; uh, he wasn't out there working out. But uh, Tyson Hill definitely impressed me. Uh, I mean, Tyson Anderson definitely impressed me, and and Dax Hill uh, is an impressive specimen as well to watch out there. So, I mean, there's talent out there, but you know how it is. There's every team and all all the 31 other teams around the league are saying, man. Look at the guys we got in, in the draft, and look at the guys we signed as free agents. And right. it's meat on the hoof, man. 
it all looks good. Now you got to, now you got to develop it. You know, you've got it signed. Now you have to develop it and, uh, and see how it goes. Yeah, exactly. And, and how cool is it that we are talking about depth and that's where we're at on, on this team. I mean, we really, on the offensive line, like, Lap, I love this. We really only have to worry about one position. Like you said, left guard, long as everybody stays healthy, you know, got to knock on wood, make sure that happens. And so going to, I guess, address the offensive line for what Frank Pollock said. And I love Frank Pollock and his quotes. You know, he, they all got that stuff in their neck. I'm not going to use the exact word yeah, that right, he said. Right. But, but I, I think he really likes Bolson out of, out of North Dakota State. It's how, He was speaking glowingly on him. Do you think he has a, a legit shot at starting over – Jax Carmen and Deontay Smith. I mean, because those two could or should make a big leap this year, being their second year in the NFL. Yeah, I, I think I think that it's going to be an interesting battle, and and I, I can see why he's uh, he's excited about uh, about Volson. This guy, he's got a very very stout lower body on him, man. His trunk from the waist down, he's put together. Right. And he's developed. He's developed. He's got overall body strength, and um, you know, I, I I like him. His dad, his dad has a company that puts. Uh, uh, trains that have been derailed. He fixes the really? tracks and all that and puts, oh. puts trains back on track. And so Cordell Volson has done a lot of picking up railroad ties and just like old country raw, you know, old man yeah. strength, raw right, bone right. kind of guy. And he, he's, he's that kind of guy. He's got that kind of a work ethic to him and um, got to, got to talk to him a little bit in the locker room. Very impressed with him. Uh, he wants to just come in and learn, you know, and, and, uh, and compete. And he has no, no qualms about playing that guard position. He's played it some, you know, and, and when, when you're on a, in a program, like, like he was at North Dakota state played in the school record, 65 games, 41 straight starts Ooh. and uh, played on five consecutive conference championship teams, four national championships played there for six years because of COVID. Right. I mean, this, this kid's, you know, he's got some experience. I mean, he's not a, He's not a snot-nosed uh, youngin, you know. I mean, he, he's <laughs> right. he, he's gotten after it for a little bit for a while. And and at North Dakota State, they run a lot of two and three tight end um, packages. It's a pro-style running game, and so they they they're very physical with their running game. I I think he could translate pretty darn well. I think they're excited about him, and and I'm telling you, what from what I saw out of Ben Brown, now I granted it was shorts and t-shirt, it was underwear ball, it wasn't anything with shoulder pads or. <laughs> right. kind of thing. But he looks like he he's going to compete with some people now. He, this this kid, this college free agent, they only they only had one offensive uh, pick in the draft, and they and they drafted Volston. So to get a, a guy the caliber of Ben Brown in free agency, I think is a big get. And right. I, I think the kid's going to compete. I don't think he's there just to you know be a training camp body. I think he's going to be a hell of a lot more than that. Hey, that sounds good to me. I, like I said, I'll take your word for it. I was. I was at the same practice, but you know, I'm up on the bridge and I can see the DBs, the offensive linemen are way down there. So I couldn't see him as good yeah. as, as you could. So I'll take your word for it. But I know uh I just seeing Dax Hill, the little bit I got to see of him. I think he he's really impressive. I, I think he's gonna I don't I don't know if he's necessarily gonna start. I mean, I think Lou's gonna use him when he uses the the three safeties or whatever, but I think him and, and uh, uh Cam Taylor Britt, the, the versatility that those two bring. I, I think Lou Anarumo is just drooling. You know, he's in his in his laboratory going mix it and match, and I can put this guy here, I can put him there, and we're gonna need that with all these wide receivers that came to the AFC. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, uh, you know, you you've you've got to have versatility. Uh he he all these guys have played if they played safety, they've also played slot corner. If they played outside corner, they've also played slot corner. You know, they, they can play uh multiple positions, just like in the offensive line. Uh you know, very rarely, like Linderbaum is an, is an exception. He's a right. center, strictly right. a center. Usually guys come out of the of college football and they've played more than one position. They played either, you know, both tackles or guard and tackle or right. center and guard or both guards, whatever. You know, it's not just I'm just a right guard or I'm just a right tackle. Uh, you, you do have to have some position flexibility and position versatility to you. And same way in the secondary these days, because like you said, the the, the packages, the offensive schemes that – teams put out there and then the, the 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 physical skill sets that the players have to fill those spots man it's it, it gives it gives an offense a lot of diversity so you have to be able to match that up with uh uh flexibility and versatility with the athleticism and the speed that you have on your defensive football team and you know it's he's gonna i mean he he, he really did a heck of a job when they played uh 
you know, the Kansas City Chiefs, Patrick Mahomes was not sure what he was looking at the whole football game. Right. In terms right. of, you know, he with the eight, he rushed three and with the eight guys, athletic and versatile linebackers. And then in the secondary, you know, he only had a couple of linebackers on the field and then six DBs and they could, you know, mix and match. It is. It's, he's like a chess master, you know, trying to figure out a way to checkmate you as quickly as he possibly can, you know, and he doesn't have to substitute to do it. Right. That's the thing when you have guys that have versatility like that, if the offense doesn't substitute and they feel like they're going to try to get you in some sort of a mismatch uh, because of personnel they have on the football field without substituting, man, you can you can make your your change defensively and not have to burn timeouts to do it, and all that stuff's really valuable. Right, exactly, and, that, and that's why I, I started calling the, the defense like the amoeba defense, the, the morphing defense, because just like you said, the Kansas City game, well, then you can ro- rewind it back to the week before that, the playoff game against Tennessee where they were selling out to stop the run. So, you know, he stacked the box there, and then the next week he drops everybody back, and that is awesome. That's with the same starters. He didn't, like you said, he didn't have to change anybody out. And now with the additions we've had, it's going to give him even more flexibility, which I think is awesome. And, and it's it's taking a page from um, the, 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 the New England Patriots. That's what their defense always did. They would always try to take whatever you do well – they're trying to take that away from you. And I think that's what Lou is trying to do or has done. I don't say try, has done yeah. uh, with his defense. Yeah, I mean, Bill Belichick is is known for and, and continues to this day. I mean, from a week-to-week basis, you might as well just throw out any tendencies that you think you might have from a couple of games because he's changing. Right. He's, he's changing the way he's attacking you uh, because, you know, everybody's defense might be a little bit different. And – um like you said, he's going to take away the thing you do best, make you play left-handed if you're a right-handed player. Right. Or vice versa, if you're a left-handed player, he's going to make you play right-handed. So, you know, that's 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 his whole his whole mindset. And, I mean, when you look at him defensively with how he's lining his guys up and, and what he's doing with them week three as opposed to week 12, it's totally different. Right. And all the weeks in between have differences to it as well. So with his – the way he handles it, for the, for the reason we're talking about schematically how diverse he is, you have to be a smart football player. Yes. And that's the other thing that uh, that they've done. These guys not only book smart, you know, you got a couple of valedictorians, you know, number one in their class in high school the, right. amongst these guys that they've uh, – the free agents and the guys they've drafted and, and three-time captains, two-time captains. If you're not a captain, they're not interested in you. You know what I mean? Leadership, intelligence, uh, diversity, and, and uh, positions you can play – if you don't have that kind of thing, Bill Belichick's not interested in you. And that's what the Cincinnati Bengals are, try, are doing on their defensive side of the football as well. You know, it's, it's if you have to, quote, dumb it down, um, if you got 10 guys that can handle all the all the uh, complexity and one guy that can't, that guy's not going to be there very long. Uh, right. Because if you have to dumb it down for him and, and sacrifice what you might be able to do with all these other guys, you can't have that, man. That guy's, that guy's going to be, you know, he'll be somewhere else here pretty quickly. You, you have to be able to understand and uh, and then apply what you've what you've learned to the football field. Take it from the grease board to the football field. Exactly. Now that that brings you to your podcast because I remember you saying that exact same thing that Paul Brown told somebody in the locker room. I can't exactly remember the story you you told, but you know that basically you know we got to dumb it down for, because of you because you messed up or, or or something like that. Wasn't that the, the story you told there, Dave? Yeah, yeah. That um, Paul was uh, very very keen on. Um, he was. He, he kind of initiated the intelligence test part of uh, amongst the many innovations that Paul Brown is responsible for, starting with the face mask. You know yep. I mean? Yeah, exactly. He, well, he, the he had the, the microphones in the helmet uh, way before they yep. actually did them. That, that was oh, the yeah. one he came up with. Yep. I mean, he's, he was, he was way ahead of his time. You talk about a, a brilliant man and, uh, and he wanted to surround himself with intelligent football players and and if you if you couldn't cut the mustard, he didn't have much patience for you, because he felt like you know that was going to uh, affect the the ripple effect of that was going to be huge, right. uh, in terms of what his coordinators could actually you know include in a game plan. If, if guys, if you can, if you're gonna, it doesn't matter how complex your game plan is if you can't execute it because you're just going to kill yourself. I mean, right. the, the complexity you're beating yourself with that complexity instead of the opponent, and that's the last thing you want to do. So. If you don't have guys that can grasp it and then and then be able to, mentally and then be able to handle it and execute it physically, it's a waste of time. So you you, you got to everybody has to be on board in that regard. 
Yeah, exactly. Now, rolling back to the offensive line again. Now, I know you played, you started, I think, in every position on the offensive line, including uh, center during your career. Yeah. Um, how hard is that? Because a lot of guys, because that's one thing with Jax Carmen coming in last year, they're like, oh, he's a tackle and he's moving to guard. And, you know, this might be a, a, a big jump and yada, yada, yada. How difficult is it to to go from one position to, to the other in the offensive line? Yeah, I mean, I guess my claim to fame as such would be in, in two different games with Jim McNally as my line coach. I played all five positions in the same game, two different right, times. Right. Yep. And uh, you know, it's 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 a challenge. There's no doubt. Uh, the mental part of it, you know, first and foremost, you have to be able to know your assignments and uh, and then be able to execute it physically. And each each position has has its own demands from a physical standpoint, and and they they differ. So you have to you have to you know be able to have a little bit of everything I guess in order to try to do it, um, but the you know that that's the thing that Paul Brown and, and Bill Tiger Johnson, my line coach, uh, early on in my career as a, as a rookie. In fact, they're like, look, we we don't want you to learn just your assignments. We want you to learn everybody's assignments. Right. So if you're if you pull as a right guard, as the center reach in the tackle blocking down, we have a fullback fill in for your area of responsibility, you're vacating. I mean, what's going on around you? You know, we just don't want you to just tunnel vision and hone in on, on, uh, on, on what you're doing. We want you to understand why you're doing it. And the only way you can do that is to grasp what everybody's doing. So I think that, that mentality helped me be able to play all five of the line spots as well, because it wasn't just, you know, I just didn't want to learn just one, uh, area of responsibility, one set of, uh, of, uh, assignments. You know, I just, I wanted to try to grasp, what the coaches were thinking and why they were thinking it. Exactly. That, that role is exactly into, into what Frank Pollock said. You know, these, these young guys are coming into a room with grown, grown men, you know, married men, like, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta really show up and this is a job. This is pretty, you know, it is what it is, you know, it's a business, but it's also a game. And like Frank said, and, and sometimes it's very cutthroat, but that's the way it is. You got to show up lunch, lunch bucket in hand and ready to go and ready to compete every single day for these jobs. Cause there's only so many of them. Yeah. I mean, I, I like I like all of his uh, all of his little lines that he's got. Oh, like I love them. Blank, <laughs> blank awesome. in the neck, a glass eater. You yes. know, glass eater is pretty descriptive. You know, that's a that's a great term. I love. I've I've heard that before, but uh, that that that's a that's a great term. But yeah, he wants he wants you know tough minded guys, right? And physically tough guys. You know, there's there's no question about it. And um, yeah, it's it, it's no joke. Uh, a lot of times you go to you, you play at college and you, you're a young kid coming out of high school, 18 years old, and you might be going against you know guys that redshirted that are 22, 23 years old. Right. Well, that ain't nothing. Sometimes <laughs> you're coming to the National Football League as a 21 year old kid or a 20 year old kid if you come out early. Right. You're playing against 32 year old men. You know. Right. That are, that's like that's a that's a that's a. <laughs> That's a big you know, jump. <laughs> that's a big, big jump, man. And and there is something to be said for old man strength, you know, and uh, as your body matures uh, in, in functional football strength. So, yeah, you have to be on point in terms of your technique and you have to execute it properly or you're going to get overwhelmed. Exactly. All right. So the schedule uh, release came out Thursday and uh, look, the Bengals have five primetime games, possibly could be six if they get one flexed. And it looks like first glance, the it's kind of, I want, the whole schedule is kind of hard, but the beginning of it is probably a little more easier than the back half. I don't know about you. I kind of like it that we're having the harder games at the end of the season because that gets you more, I think, gets you more into playoff mode. What, how do you think it, the schedule laid out for the Bengals? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 an interesting schedule. There's no question about it. They've got, uh, you, like you said, the five primetime games. And then they've also got three games at, with a 425 right. kickoff with the right. second game of a piggyback doubleheader. Which also gets big eyes, and you know, and it's a it, it's a different um, terms of getting your body ready d- during that day. It's a, it's a little bit later game, but you know, they they play the Dallas Cowboys, the Kansas City Chiefs, and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So I mean, any one of those games could have been nationally televised as well. Mm-hmm. But I think they look at it and they say, you know, why have Tom Brady and Joe Burrow on a on a primetime national game? Why have them go against each other? They're going to draw eyes by themselves. You know, maybe. It make sure we get get the some of these covered in the 425s. We're gonna get huge numbers there as well. So literally half the schedule, eight mm-hmm. of the games are you know not one o'clock kickoffs. In fact, they've only got one back-to-back Sunday 1 p.m. kickoff the entire schedule. That's October 16th and October 23rd. They play at one o'clock down at New Orleans, 
and then they play the Falcons in in uh, Cincinnati at Paul Brown Stadium, back to back one o'clock. Other than that, it's it's never back to back one o'clock. So you're playing, you're playing uh, Thursday games. You're playing Saturday afternoon games. That's because of Christmas Eve. Mm-hmm. You know, you're playing Sunday uh, one o'clock, Sunday four thirty, Sunday eight twenty. You're playing Monday night. I mean, you're playing different days, different times of the day. So I think I think the big challenge is the players. They got to be accountable. I mean, they right. got they got to make some sacrifices. They got to make sure they take care of their their diet, proper rest. Uh, you know, they train their bodies right, and then the coaches are you know going to make sure that they they figure out the best way to give them some time off. It's a short week, long week. They're going to have to play with all of those uh, all of those kind of things. And it is it's it's much easier. Your, your body kind of gets in a almost like a in a cycle, like an alarm clock cycle, you know, and. Sunday at one o'clock, Sunday one o'clock, Sunday one o'clock. Well, that's not going to be the case this year whatsoever. And uh, with that success comes the comes this type of schedule. And you like to have this kind of schedule. But like you said, the f- four of the first six games are are on the road mm-hmm. uh, in in the beginning of the season. But I don't think they're as tough as opponents as at the end of the season. Right. Four of the last six games are at home. Mm-hmm. But man, down the stretch here, yeah, it's I mean, going. After the bye week, you're at Pittsburgh, at Tennessee. Got Kansas City and Mahomes at home. Uh, then you then you got the Deshaun Watson, the Cleveland Browns at home. You go to Tampa Bay with the the goat. You go to New England, and uh, you know that Jones made the Pro Bowl. Right, right. Took, took his team to the playoffs last year. And then you got Monday Night Football against the Buffalo Bills and Allen, and then you finish with Lamar Jackson in Baltimore. I mean, <laughs> here in Cincinnati, that right. is that's a beast of a schedule. But mm-hmm. at least you know they've got. They got back-to-back uh, home games a couple of times in that stretch, um, you know, which for the last six games being at home, that that that's a little bit helpful. But that's going to be – that's when the rubber meets the road. That's when you're going to find out if you're a playoff team or not. There's no question. Yeah, exactly. Now, now we have the construction. It's already started of the of the practice bubble. How much is that going to to help out? You think, especially later on in the season when it gets colder and rainy and stuff, and we have these harder teams. How much? How much is that going to help? How, how big a difference is that going to have as far as practice goes to be in the practice in the bubble and not have to be out in the cold? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that uh, if if it's not terrible in terms of the temperature. I wouldn't mind practicing outside because you're going to have to play in it. Right. But if, but if it's to the point where it's affecting how you're able to even execute, go inside and get reps where you're going to have, you know, you can actually execute and see if what you're thinking is the way to go. You know I mean? Sometimes I remember having practices where it was so damn cold, couldn't get anything done. Right. You know, because there's, there's no, there's no adrenaline flowing, you know, it's just, Oh man, this is a grind. And you, you're just, you're looking for it to end instead of just, you know, having your head in it as, as right. much as you should, you know, you're just trying to survive out there. So, uh, I, yeah, I think you, were, you were down at Spinney field with all, with all the, the nice smells that they had from, yeah. from the, from the, yeah. the sewer district right next to you as well, too. <laughs> yeah. Well, there was great aroma down there. There's no question. <laughs> that and, was. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, you know, if, if you're going to, if you're going to go out, it, it's the quality of the work, you know, right. and that, and, and if you go out, and and it's so miserable that you're not going to be efficient with what you're doing. How good a practice is that? If you can, if you can go out and get, if you can go indoors into a bubble and get quality reps, mm-hmm. I think that's that's the goal. Um, and then you know both teams are going to have to adjust to the cold weather. Game day, it's a different dynamic. The, like I said, the adrenaline's flowing and everything else. But if if it's you know if temperatures are in the 30s or whatever, I wouldn't mind still practicing outside. But if you get down to you know, single digits and there's wind chill and stuff, man. Yeah. That that, yeah. that that's gonna that's a tough tough dynamic. And you always want to have a bubble, particularly and not just not just cold weather, but if you have a torrential downpour, you know, I mean, yeah. that that I was uh, in that last year. I, I was up on the bridge last year when it, yeah. it just got just. And I'm just like, all right, well, I, I'm stuck up here anyway. I got soaked, and yeah. I'm not kidding. It was it was like a tropical storm coming through. And I'm sitting there going, how in the hell can they practice in this? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, if it's uh, if it's icy or rainy or whatever, if you have you know elements like that. Go inside and get some work done. Again, it's 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 the quality of the reps, not just the quantity. It's the quality of uh, how you're able to go execute your reps. You know, that's a big big factor. Exactly. Now, moving into to this year, we haven't uh, hasn't been announced yet. But you know, last year they they did the Ring of Honor, and we had the the four new members. 
Um, who who do you think will, will get in this year? I mean, my vote is I'm hoping Willie Anderson gets in because I'm hoping that'll like, hey, we got him in our Ring of Honor. You guys should put him in the Hall of Fame. He should already be in there. But who do you think is going to be uh, the next members of the Ring of Honor? And what do you think Big Willie's chances are of getting into the Hall of Fame this year? Yeah, I, I, you know, I mean, there's so many guys that you can say uh, are deserving to be in the Ring of Honor. I, I wouldn't have any problem with, you know, eight guys that they, and you can't, you can't put everybody in at once. Right. So it, it's, it's a matter of, uh, you know, if you don't, if you, if you, if you're not, uh, if you're not chosen this year, be patient and sit tight because it's going to be coming to you eventually. Right. But I, I do agree. I think Willie, I think Willie Anderson, um, it was such a dominant player. And if he had been with a, with a team that had had a little bit better success during his playing days, I mean, right. man, it would, you know, cause he, he was, he was just a, a, a road grader in mm-hmm. terms of the running game and just very, very agile and a tremendous pass protector as well. Uh, total package. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, anything that would help Willie get in the hall of fame where he belongs. And, uh, and, then, and there are other guys too, that, I think are Hall of Fame worthy, and you can't. It's you know I I know the NFL is, it says look I know you guys feel like you've got you know six eight ten players to be in the Hall of Fame, but every team in the NFL we've got one team, in there. That's it. We no. only got one. Like right. come on. <laughs> True. They're, they're they're everybody every team has you know six eight ten players that they think should be in there. Right. But uh, you know hopefully hopefully Kenny Anderson you know get right. in there get Kenny in, Riley <laughs> Kenny Riley you know yeah. those, hopefully that that'll help those guys as well last year's class as well as anybody that's uh, going to be cho- chosen here in the future. Hopefully that solidifies, you know, that, that uh, gets, gets them over the hump because they're all deserving. There, there's, there's no, no question about it. No two ways about it. You know, in, in this deal about like Kenny, for example, uh, not being in the hall of fame because he didn't win the Super Bowl. Well, I don't remember Dan yeah. Faust winning yeah. one. Good I mean, point. I was just about to say that. Good. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, exa- they're examples. I mean, there's exceptions to every rule. And if you're the only this one to me, he's the only guy that's uh, that won uh, passing titles back to back years in different decades, mm-hmm. and he's not in the Hall of Fame. Right. Come on now, right. come on now. I mean, exactly. won passing titles in hey, back when you, you, you could pass it as good either. It's not. It's not. We're close to the rules that they have now. What Kenny Anderson did back back then, it's even harder because they could mug guys going down the field. Yeah. Oh well, yeah. I mean, it was. It was uh, it was different on the quarterback to do uh, today too. They they uh, intelligently protect the quarterback more so than they did when Kenny played. Mm-hmm. I mean, he he could get clotheslined and everything else, and there was no, um, you know, it, it it got better as he played. But in the early stage of his career, I mean, man, well, she, quarterbacks were fair game. It was hunting season, man. I see you got and, that uh, Jack Lambert hit, hit. I think it was where he about broke his his neck. Was it Lambert who grabbed his face mask and? And pulled Kenny almost all the way around. I think that was no. Him. That was that was uh. What what defensive end was that? That was one of the defensive ends that uh, that did. It was was it Keith Gary? I think it might have been Keith Gary. Okay. I can't remember. It's what was the out of that. Yeah, he he definitely he got his he, he got a, it was the Exorcist man. It looked like his head <laughs> right. turned all the way around right. on his shoulders. It was crazy. But yeah, I mean, you look at uh, and, and like Isaac Curtis. Isaac Curtis averages over seventeen yards a catch for his career. Back yeah, then, they, they changed. They changed a rule in the NFL because of Isaac right. Curtis. If you right. change a rule because of a player, that man deserves to be in the Hall of Fame right there because of that right there. Yeah, and I think I think part of that is Paul Brown, who held a lot of power, you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, 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 he, he was on the rules committee, and, and he said, look, uh, this this is ridiculous. Uh, he was, he was again, a man ahead of his time, and he could see the NFL – adapting to the more of the style of play they're doing now, he could right. see it even back then and thought, look, the only way to do it is not let these talented receivers get mugged and tackled 20 yards down the football field. Right. You know, and, and, the, and the thing is, if you threw the football 20, 22, 24 times a game, that was a ton. Right. Now that's not even half, you know, I mean, if you, if you've thrown it 24 times at halftime, that's expected, you know? So <laughs> the, the game is, is changed so much and that's the other thing too is when you compare stats you have to you have to statistically compare to the era that was played right because you you can't transpose well isaac's numbers now then is compared to now it's it's not even it's 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 orange apples and oranges not even the same type of comparison exactly exactly and i think one one more quick thing with with kenny anderson 
Uh, Dan Fouts is in the in the uh, Hall of Fame. Um, Kenny Anderson and you you guys uh, you guys beat uh, Dan Fouts in the I don't know the Freezer Bowl right to go to the Super Bowl. But that's Dan right. Fouts is in that I I still don't understand. That, that's my argument, a, a big time argument right there. The AFC Championship if winning counts, and Dan Fouts never went to a Super Bowl. Ken Anderson went and he beat Dan Fouts to get to it in one of the coldest games ever in history. Again, how is he not in there? I, yeah, I like, and, just, and what they do is they give the excuse. Well. It was a cold day. That's what. That's why Dan. Well, it was a cold day for Ken Anderson too. Damn it! You know I mean? <laughs> exactly. It went both ways. I'm like, I mean, that doesn't make any. Oh, it's, anyway. you, you can spin. You can spin arguments any way you want to spin them. You know, it's unbelievable. Right. right exactly. It doesn't make any sense. It's, it's very frustrating. But I'm very excited about the season. I think we got a great shot at going back to the Super Bowl. Who knows if we do or not? You know, a lot of things got to happen. We got to stay healthy. You know, a lot of stuff broke away last year. And we got a tougher schedule, but I, I think we got a great shot of doing it. And hopefully we'll actually win it this year. And when when we win one, whenever that is, I'm buying me a, 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 a replica ring. I'm just saying. I'm, I'm not part of the team, but I feel like it. So I'm going to at least get a, a replica ring. Anyway, Lap, I appreciate you coming on. Tell everybody about your podcast and everything you got going on real quick. Yeah, we've got a, a podcast that uh, it's called In the Trenches with Dave Lap and brought to you by First Star Logistics. You can get it. Anywhere you follow your podcast, the podcast video cast that we do, and uh, try to try to cover the NFL uh, as much as we possibly can with every type of guest you can think of, uh, players, coaches, uh, general managers, broadcasters, whatever the case may be, and try to be topical with uh, other sports as well. But it is pretty pretty football driven. There's no question about it. And as you know, I mean, when you do podcasts, you find things out that uh, right you know didn't necessarily know that was exactly the way it was or whatever, and Right, exactly. Yeah. Well, like you just One said, last thing about the Super Bowl. I mean, been there three times now, right. getting closer. Five <laughs> points, four <laughs> points, three points. Getting uh, closer. Man. Dude, dude, my my daughter, I was so upset after we lost again. My daughter, God love her. She goes, Dad, but she's 17. She I don't make her sound like she's a little little kid, but she's 17. She's always my baby. But she's like, Dad, she goes, but at least they made it. I said, I know, honey, but I've watched them lose it three <laughs> times. I'm like, and they were in all three games. I'm like, yeah. oh my God. <laughs> It's rough. It's rough. It Dave. Is rough. It is rough. <laughs> but I feel you, man. And like I said, I, 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 I'm doing this from a fan perspective. I mean, you lived it. You played in one, and you broadcast two of them. So I know it's it's got to be eating you alive, worse than me. But I mean, it, it's it's awful. But we're going to get it done, Lap. We're going to get it done. I think it's going to happen here within the Joe Burrow era, sometime. Yeah, I mean, I, I I've got you know friends and family also that hey, well, you know, the team's been there three times. There, there are not a whole lot of fr- franchises in the National Football League that can say they've been to the Super Bowl three times. I said, I'll grant you that. That's exactly right. But I can tell you, <laughs> having been there three times, not won one, that it's tough to lose them, man. Yes, it's it sucks. Like, it's oh, my tough. God. It's horrible. Anyway, well, I appreciate you, man. I'll see you uh, at practice here when they start again because I'll, I'll be up on the bridge. <laughs> All right, man. Have a good one. Thanks, buddy. See ya.